Most, if not all, freshwater aquariums contain a small number of hydra, but they often go unnoticed by the fish keeper because they're quite small and they don't move around a whole lot. But when conditions are to their liking, such as when they have a steady supply of food like baby brine shrimp or microworms, the number of hydra in your tank can increase very quickly. And that's when most fish keepers begin to panic and start searching the internet for answers. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there that confuses people and causes unnecessary fear. So I'd like to set the record straight and clear up some of the confusion and dispel many of the myths that surround these strange little creatures. And if you bear with me, I'm sure that by the time you're done watching this video, I will have answered all of your questions. So let's start with the basics first. Hydra are the freshwater relatives of jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals. There are many different species of hydra and they occur on every continent except Antarctica. Some are clear, white, brown, or even green like the ones you see here. Large numbers of hydra are commonly seen in fry grow-out tanks where we've been feeding the newborn fish with lots of small live foods, such as the baby brine shrimp that you see here. Hydra have two ways in which they can reproduce. They can do it asexually through a process known as budding, where a new hydra begins to grow from the body of the parent. This method of reproduction produces an exact clone of the parent, and it's the main method that the hydra uses to create new individuals. The budding process can produce a new hydra in just a few days, and once the process is complete, the newly formed hydra will detach from its parent and float away to a new location. Nonetheless, a hydra can either be a male, a female, or a hermaphrodite. If it's a male hydra, it will develop testes that produce sperm. And if it's a female hydra, it will have an ovary that produces eggs. And the hydra that you're looking at here has both an ovary and testes, which makes this individual a hermaphrodite because it has both male and female body parts. Larger hydras are more likely to develop into hermaphrodites, while smaller individuals tend to either be a male or a female. Nonetheless, male hydra will release their sperm into the water column where they'll swim until they find a female that has an egg. The sperm then enters the egg and fertilization occurs. In the case of a hermaphrodite, they can either self-fertilize or be fertilized by another hydra. Either way, the fertilized hydra egg grows a thick protective coating over the top and development of the embryo inside the egg stops. The egg then drops off of the parent and sinks to the bottom of the tank where it will wait until conditions improve. These resting eggs can withstand drying out completely as well as freezing temperatures while they wait until more favorable conditions return. Then development of the embryo will resume until the baby hydra hatches. And these resting eggs bring us to our first myth or misunderstanding because some people believe that brine shrimp eggs might contain resting hydra eggs that then infect the tank with hydra when we feed our fish with baby brine shrimp. However, hydra are freshwater creatures while brine shrimp live in saltwater habitats, so the chances of you introducing hydra eggs into your tank by hatching brine shrimp eggs and then feeding baby brine shrimp to your fish are near zero. The fact is that there were hydra in your tank to begin with, and feeding your fish live baby brine shrimp is what caused the hydra population to expand, because not only were you feeding your baby fish, but you were also feeding the hydra as well. And those hydra were probably introduced into your aquarium on live plants, daphnia cultures, driftwood, or anything else that came from an outside water source. 
and I suspect that there may even be hydra, or more likely, their resting eggs in the public water supply, but I haven't yet confirmed this, so I'm conducting an experiment to find out if the water right out of my faucet contains some form of hydra. Because not only can they reproduce by budding and by producing resting eggs, but any small piece of the hydra can grow into a whole new individual. And this is because hydra have specialized stem cells that can change into any type of cell that they need, which allows the hydra to regrow any body part that they want. Furthermore, hydra are constantly regenerating every cell in the body so that they never really get old, and they're practically immortal. However, they can die of disease, starvation, or by being poisoned, as well as by being eaten. But other than that, they can theoretically live forever. In fact, you can even take a hydra and blend it up into a liquid, and the individual cells can then reassemble themselves back into a whole new hydra. And scientists have been trying to figure out how they do this for a very long time. The species of hydra that we're looking at throughout this video is called Hydra viridissima, and it gets its green coloration from a very specific type of single-celled algae that lives and grows inside the hydra. The algae and the hydra have what's known as a symbiotic relationship where both species can benefit from each other's presence, and the basis for this close relationship is an exchange of nutrients between the two species. Because when there's not enough food for the hydra to eat, the algae can still use photosynthesis to convert sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide into nutrients that the hydra can then use as food. Symbiotic relationships between different life forms seems to be the rule rather than the exception, and this is just another example of how nothing lives in isolation, but we are all dependent on each other for our survival. And right now, these hydra are depending on me to provide them with lots of food. Which brings me to the next misunderstanding that some fish keepers have when it comes to hydra. Because some people believe that feeding powdered foods or crushed up flake food will feed the hydra and cause their numbers to increase. However, hydra only eat live foods, so flake foods and other non-living foods will not be eaten by the hydra. But an excessive amount of these foods will cause an increase in the number of tiny invertebrates living in the tank that the hydra will then feed on. So overfeeding of prepared foods can inadvertently cause an outbreak of hydra. So the question now becomes, how do we get rid of the hydra? Because many people worry that the hydra are going to eat their baby fish as well as their newborn shrimp. And the truth of the matter is that hydra are far too small and delicate to catch and eat newborn cherry shrimp or your baby fish. Now I know some of you may be skeptical because everywhere you look on the internet people are repeating the same old story, but that doesn't make it true. A newly hatched baby brine shrimp is just under half a millimeter in length, and that's what you're looking at here. Now see for yourself how big these baby brine shrimp are in comparison to these full-grown hydra, and look at how distended the body of the hydra is once it does swallow a baby brine shrimp. The fact is, a baby brine shrimp is a relatively big meal, even for a fully grown hydra, and newborn cherry shrimp are about two to four times bigger than a newly hatched baby brine shrimp. So imagine a hydra catching and swallowing something two to four times larger than one of these little brine shrimp. I won't say that it's impossible, but it's very, very unlikely, and it's even less likely that they can catch and eat baby fish.
So it's a myth that hydra are going to eat your baby shrimp. And as far as fish go, a baby guppy is about 12 times larger than a baby brine shrimp. So the hydra won't be eating your baby guppies either. Furthermore, both the shrimp and the baby fish are much stronger and more capable swimmers than these wimpy little brine shrimp. So I think that the danger that the hydra poses to both baby fish and baby shrimp is greatly exaggerated. And like I said in the beginning of the video, most, if not all, aquariums have a small number of hydra in them. But their numbers don't increase to the point where we begin to notice them until we start to supply them with the tiny prey items that they need to grow their population. And this usually comes in the form of baby brine shrimp, daphnia, and microworms. And if you don't put these things in your tank, then you'll probably never even notice that the hydra are there. Which is just further proof that they're not surviving and multiplying by eating your baby fish or your baby shrimp. But still, people tend to panic when they see things in their tank that they don't understand. So the fear sets in and they go looking for solutions. And quite often these solutions come in a bottle of poison that your local shop is only too happy to sell you. However, chemical treatment should be a last resort. And as you've probably been able to tell by now, I don't believe that these hydra are something that you really need to worry about. But people tend to trust the hype more than the truth. So there are two chemical treatments that are often recommended. One is called noplanaria and the other is a chemical called fenbendazole that is used to get rid of worms in goats. Both of these chemicals will also kill snails and if used incorrectly might also harm your shrimp as well. So always follow the manufacturer's instructions and monitor your fish and shrimp for any signs of distress. But please remember, when you add a poison to your tank, all of the tiny invertebrates that you kill will begin to decompose and negatively affect your water quality, which might do way more damage than the hydra ever could. So caution is advised. And there's no evidence that these chemicals will have any effect on the hydra's resting eggs that are sitting in your substrate just waiting for the conditions to improve so that they can hatch. So you may have to add these poisons to your tank more than once to really wipe them out altogether, but I can almost guarantee that they'll find their way back in. Some other options for dealing with hydra are to use fish that might eat them, such as paradise fish, honey gouramis, and sparkling gouramis. But these fish need to be hungry in order to go after the hydra, and they might also eat your shrimp. Some people have also reported that snails eat hydra as well, but I have yet to see this for myself, so I am a little skeptical. This ramshorn snail certainly doesn't seem interested in eating these hydra, but I've heard that bladder snails might be an option as well. For smaller numbers of hydra attached to the glass at the front of the tank, you can use a small siphon hose made out of airline tubing attached to a small wooden dowel to suck out the hydra. This method works well for removing hydra and not leaving any small pieces behind because any tiny piece of the hydra that you break off can regrow into a whole new hydra. But with the suction method, you're less likely to leave small bits of the hydra behind. Now, as you watch this footage of these hydra eating microworms, you'll see some of these hydra wiggling. And it's important to mention that hydra don't normally wiggle like this. That movement that you're seeing is caused by the microworms, which are still alive, moving around inside the hydra long after they've been swallowed. Nonetheless, the best method by far to control a hydra outbreak is to cut off their food supply. And once you stop putting baby brine shrimp, daphnia, and microworms into your tank, the number of hydra will decrease dramatically because many of them will starve and die. But remember, there will still be resting eggs in the substrate. 
So my final bit of advice is to embrace all of the tiny creatures that can appear in your aquarium because the vast majority of them will do no harm. And when you do have an increase in any of them, it's an indication that there's an imbalance in your aquarium and we often rush to blame the creatures themselves. When in reality, we're the ones to blame, but still, we insist on calling these little miracles of evolution tiny monsters and we rush to vanquish them with our poisons. When we should in fact be paying attention to the lessons that they have to teach us because we still have so much to learn. Thank you so much for watching another one of my videos, and I really hope that you have a beautiful day.